So this entire video, which you're watching right now, was actually typed with just my left hand. And it was actually really, really freaking hard. I never felt more mentally challenged in my life. <laughs> The book, The Master and His Emissary, uses the metaphor of a master and his emissary, a king who rules virtuously over his kingdom and an emissary to whom the king must assign a certain amount of responsibility because the king can't handle everything himself. However, the emissary, being ignorant of the king's role in running the kingdom and how necessary he is for the vitality of the kingdom, begins to believe that he is superior to the king and that he himself is the master. This metaphor is meant to explain the neurological power struggle that's been occurring for centuries between our two hemispheres. Because in reality, the right hemisphere should be seen as the master of the two. It is more in tune with reality and the real actual world of lived experience and is capable of understanding the world in a way that is more whole, more complete, and is properly contextualized. Whereas the left hemisphere should be thought of as the emissary because it plays an important function in decontextualizing the world and making it explicit so that we can interact with it in a more directed manner. But it fails to have the same grasp on the nature of things that the right hemisphere has. It seems to be more interested in the map of the terrain rather than the terrain itself. But in recent times, the left hemisphere has begun to think of itself as the master, and it has begun to play a disproportionate role in our cognition. Whereas the more overarching and ultimately more significant role played by the right hemisphere is being replaced by the left hemisphere, which now believes itself to be the supreme authority of the psyche. And this is a problem for quite a few reasons. When we live inside this virtual world that we create in our head, as rather than the actual world of lived experience, it makes people very reliant on the parts of their psyche that are conscious and explicit, and it disregards our unconscious functioning. But the unconscious consists of a substantially larger proportion of the psychic totality. Consciousness is characterized by a very specific mentality, which likes to break things apart and, and separates things from the context in which they live and produces this kind of abstracted map of reality. And one effect of being overly reliant on this type of thinking is that it makes us take a fairly complicated situation and dumb it down to something that is ultimately a false representation of it, which fails to grasp the full complexity of a given situation. And we tend to prefer this incomplete representation of the thing rather than dealing with the full complexity of it. The world out there is immensely complicated, but consciousness has difficulty grasping it because it needs to simplify things in order to make the world graspable and to make it manipulable. And that's why it uses words. A word is fundamentally a code which can distill a fairly complex idea into a simple token, which makes it more easy to speak about that object as well as to reference it. Reducing the world to words causes us to fail in capturing the true complexity and true uniqueness of the situation. This tendency to abstraction has a lot of issues. My favorite example, because it strikes at the heart of the matter really, is the idea of religion. Like if I just say the word religion, that gives you an impression of a thing. And that might kind of depend on the way you're conceptualizing it, but ultimately the word kind of just stands on its own as a fairly simple phenomenon. But the phenomenon of religion is not simple at all. It's immensely complex, which is why two religions can be completely distinct in a lot of ways, but just using the word religion distills them of all of that complexity. This preference for simplicity is a attractive to most people. We like when things are simple because it hurts our heads to actually grapple with the complexity of things. Whenever the multifaceted nature of reality like starts to crowd in around us, we tend to resist that and tend to prefer the simplified version of reality. And that's what explicitness does. Explicitness doesn't actually grasp reality as it is. It makes a, a, a kind of um, a decontextualized version of it. But this simplified picture of reality fails to integrate the true world and its various facets when making important decisions. This is actually what I believe happened with COVID lockdowns. Governments needed to make a decision about how they're gonna deal with this health crisis. But to do so, they kind of deserialized people and turned them into these statistical entities rather than fully fledged human individuals with their own lives and their own idiosyncrasies. When you treat people as statistics, you strip them of the insanely idiosyncratic phenomenon that they actually are. And instead you treat them like they're sets in a math problem. So that type of linear deductive logical thinking does have its uses, but it would be really foolish for this kind of mathematical digitalized version of thinking to guide major decisions like that. We need to rely on the unconscious, which is more deeply in touch with our emotions and which can 
better grasp the whole rather than kind of dealing with decontextualized abstracted parts. So for example, when you treat people as statistical phenomena and dictate that they all must be locked down during COVID, you ignore things like mental health concerns. And that's a large reason why COVID lockdowns had such a negative impact on people's mental health. Governments weren't treating people like these unique entities whose complexity was basically ungraspable, but rather as just simple numbers. This is actually a feature of authoritarian thinking. Another example would be something like the One China Policy, which again, treats people like they're machines rather than fully fledged organisms. So what are we to do about this, about the fact that people seem to think that this abstracted version of the world that they have in their heads is equivalent to the world and that we should be um, operating on this abstracted world in the, rather than the actual world. What should we do to redress the fact that people aren't relying on the part of their minds which is more in tune with the actual nature of things? Ian McGillcrest, who was the first to identify this problem, offers many potential solutions for how we can redress the balance. But I think the simplest solution is actually the easiest to implement. And I don't know for sure if this is like an actual solution that will solve the problem, but I feel like it is. And that solution is to train yourself to become ambidextrous. If you're right-handed, which the vast majority of people are, use your left hand more and become proficient with your left hand. You might be thinking to yourself, well, how does that fix the problem? Well, here's what I believe. The fact that we're handed at all, that we're dexterous with one hand at all is kind of bizarre. It just shows that we're like asymmetrical. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason why our two hemispheres are distinct. It's so that they can um, deal with different types of information and they can approach the world from two different perspectives. And those perspectives are kind of incompatible. So it makes sense to kind of compartmentalize them into separate units so that they can do their function without uh, interrupting the other function. So handedness makes sense but this has an unintended consequence. And that's the fact that our right hand, which is our main instrument for manipulating the world, literally because the word manipulate means to, to fiddle with your hands, to handle an object, is controlled by our left hemisphere. And this gives the left hemisphere significantly more power than the right hemisphere. You can actually see this for yourself if you try to use your non-dominant hand for something, such as typing on your keyboard or opening your fridge or even writing. You'll quickly see the nature of this power imbalance. You'll even feel your left hemisphere protesting, trying to get you to use it instead of your right hemisphere. So using your non-dominant hand, I think actually goes some way to redressing this power imbalance because you're very literally making the right hemisphere more competent and more capable of doing things. If it's kind of like in this stunted state, it doesn't have as much power in the world. And by using your left hand, you're actually engaging your right hemisphere more. And so its mode of thinking, which is drastically more complete than the left hemisphere's mode of thinking, will give it a greater impetus to assert its way of thinking. But if you think to yourself, that doesn't actually make any sense because we're born either left-handed or right-handed. You can't choose to just be left-handed. That's probably your left hemisphere oversimplifying things again. And that's actually how the left hemisphere tends to see the world. It tends to see things as static, you know, permanent and unchanging, which makes sense because when the left hemisphere needs to make general rules about things, those rules tend to be fixed. They tend to be crystallized and inflexible to change. But it turns out the brain is one of those objects which is unbelievably dynamic and which resists our attempts to produce a coherent and explicit understanding of it because the brain is immensely plastic and dynamic. So if you try to switch to your left hand, you're gonna feel awkward and clumsy at first, but the more you practice, the more your right hemisphere will dynamically change to accommodate the fact that you're becoming more dexterous. And I believe that this will allow the right hemisphere's mode of thinking to manifest more into the world and give it more power to actually do things and manifest itself rather than letting the left hemisphere make all the major decisions and letting the left hemisphere kind of um, be, the, be the thing that guides our decisions in the world. And I think this actually has a lot more benefits than just fixing this master emissary imbalance. It also makes you just more flexible in general. I like to think of the example of like a soldier. If you're holding a gun like a rifle and you're right-handed, you'll usually hold the trigger in your right hand. But this makes it awkward when you're trying to check corners that turn to the right. And as it turns out, half of all corners turn to the right. So if you get good at holding the gun in a different way, you'll be more flexible and be able to do more your right hemisphere will be less incompetent, which is the situation with people in the modern world today. Their right hemispheres are not as competent as their left hemispheres because you're using your right hand so much. And again, your right hand is connected to your left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere has way more power and way more expression and way more ability to manipulate the world. Some of that power needs to go back to the right hemisphere. So I hope that example gets the point across, but it's easier said than done, obviously. If you do try to do it, you will feel that it takes a lot of effort and you'll feel really clumsy and awkward um, and you'll be 
and you'll get really frustrated right quickly because something that you could do relatively easily is now extremely difficult. So you'll have to relearn extremely simple tasks if you decide to do that. But for this reason, I've decided that I'm gonna try and use my left hemisphere more. I'm gonna actually try to do this rather than just suggest other people do it. So this entire video, which you're watching right now, was actually typed with just my left hand. And it was actually really, really freaking hard. I never felt more mentally challenged in my life. <laughs> but I've also been doing things like brushing my teeth with my left hand, um, eating with my left hand. And I plan to report on the results of this experiment in the future to see if it actually has the intended effect. If I know, if I notice anything phenomenologically changing about my brain or about the way I think about things or about the, or with respect to the way I interact with the world. Because while I suspect that this is largely beneficial, there haven't actually been any studies or m any major studies that I know of um, that have uh, tested the effects of ambidexterity in terms of gaining ambidexterity rather than being born ambidextrous. There have been very few studies that actually assess what happens when a person tries to use their left hand a lot more. So rather than just hypothesizing about it, I'm going to try it and see if it actually produces any benefits. And I'll let you know. But what do you guys think? Does that sound like it makes sense or does that sound completely crazy? I think it makes sense because giving more power to that other side will increase its ability to affect the world. And you're just stimulating your left, your right hemisphere more and maybe that itself will generate more of a right hemisphere way of thinking. We'll, we'll have to see. And there might be unintended consequences as well. And if that happens, I'll let you know as well. Anyways, thanks for watching. Please consider subbing to me on Patreon. Um, if you do, you'll have a way to actually talk to me directly if you want to discuss things. But yeah, have a good day and may good luck always come your way. Thank you.